I want to help build an army of solutionists. I want to help empower the next generation to solve this problem. We're not interested in a version of the future in which the climate is stable, but people are still being exploited. You can do anything. You can do anything and play a role in crafting this vision together. We just need everyone to be on the same page. And that's what I'm trying to do, is get everyone this vision so that we can all work on it together. Because I think right now, the current way we talk about climate change is so abstract and large. So most people think the only thing we can do is like hope that Joe Biden builds more solar farms. But that's not it. Hello, welcome to Earth Talk, the podcast for people and the planet. A space where we talk about global challenges from different perspectives, whilst we try to focus on solutions and reasons to be hopeful in times like these. I'm Leo Holdak, and thank you for tuning in. Hello, welcome to today's episode. Today, our dear guest is Sage Linier. Thank you so much for taking your time to be here. She's a climate activist. And first, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Thank you. I'm well. A little bit exhausted from the past time being here, but I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> for, so for all the people who are right now listening, maybe they see you the first time, maybe they also hear you the first time, then do you mind to give, a, give, give ourselves like a small introduction to yourself that we know a little bit better who you are? Okay. I'm a climate activist and the executive director of Sustainable and Just Future. It is a nonprofit that I started out of a program I was teaching at Berkeley while an undergraduate that became the largest student-led class ever. Wow. Um, I developed this framework and it became so popular because I was looking for a different narrative on environmental solutions. So it's an interdisciplinary summary of environmental solutions from a justice standpoint as well. Mm -hmm. um, we've put a couple thousand people through the program and we are now a nonprofit expanding to new universities. Wow, all right. So before we maybe get into uh, your work and your history, maybe um, do you mind to give us like a small picture like where you're from that we understand a little bit also your perspective. So which place maybe do you call home and how is the place? Maybe how does it feel like? How does it looks like? Maybe how does it taste like? So they have like a better understanding of who you are and also where you're from. Right now I don't live anywhere. Mm -hmm. I gave up my lease and sold my car s four months ago and I still book another two or three months before I Uh, will be landing, I think, in New York. Yeah. Mm. I grew up in Southern California. All right. Okay. So um, you mentioned already your work, but maybe you can like give us like a small introduction also, like how did you like kind of like involve into the space? So maybe what formed you maybe as a child or whatsoever that you became interested in this field that you're now doing the work you're doing? So maybe how did your journey maybe started, started like when you were a little bit younger? I think why climate is such a funny question for people my age group, age range, because the majority of us have the same answer. It's like, you know, you heard about climate change when you were like maybe 16, maybe younger, and you were like, oh, okay, so that's going to destroy us all. Maybe that's the most important thing to focus on. <laughs> so yeah. it's not much of an origin story, but that's where it came from. Mm. Um, I, before that, was really passionate about feminism and racial justice. And so I came to environmentalism with the realization that it's like one overarching theme with all the struggles. So um, I got my start, like I said, yeah, teaching. And that's kind of why I became more well known as a climate activist because I started this program and it, it really blew up and gained popularity. And um, I just started getting a lot of press because I was like 21 and I was teaching a class of 300 people and that had never been done before. Yeah. And so, you know, and again, like it's a, it's, I'm really passionate about the, the framework that I developed. Um, It's solutions focused, it's action oriented, providing realistic next steps for how we can solve the problem and like start to do systems thinking around what, a, what the world could look like 
or ideally would like look like in 2050 and 2100. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's like, it's like food systems and decarbonization and like infrastructure and circular economy. So like big, broad concepts that really, because I think why I always say that trying to solve climate change is like trying to cure a cough when you have bronchitis. It's only one piece of this larger ecological crisis. So the framework that I developed is trying to give people a more holistic understanding of not just climate, but all these issues. But yeah, that's, that's a bit of a digression, but that's why I, um, kind of the notoriety that that started to gain. And then like time magazine, Time Magazine um, named me one of their 2023 Next Generation Leaders. Wow. And yeah, it's been a big year for me. Like that kind of, you know, it's not, it's funny because I was still doing the really impressive thing, impressive thing before that. But when something like, when an institution like Time recognizes you, you get so much more validation and people take you so much more seriously. Mm. And so I've gotten so many, like, you know, from that, I got this opportunity. And from that opportunity, I got this opportunity. And so now I'm, you know, on this like international stage now, which I wouldn't say I'm surprised at, but it's definitely like, it's been a big year because I wasn't there in January. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. I mean, like, also like I saw you there, like, I mean, like I saw you through Instagram. I saw you like a video of the web summit and I've been just so fascinated about the fact that how eloquently you were like speaking. Thank you. Uh, giving like a big speech in front of I think hundreds of people and you were just like 15,000 15,000 yeah wow that's huge and you were just like saying like hey we're not going to be happy uh being like that being like that being like that and I was just like man she's like kind of sharp like I I would like to talk to her <laughs> I wanted to the I what I did at web summit I wanted to take it as an opportunity to not talk about myself, but to offer a lesson instead. Mm. Um, I don't think it's so interesting to tell my story a hundred thousand times. I get you. I'd rather start doing my work, which is to educate people so that we can put different plans into action. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I have some very specific things to say to the tech industry. Yeah. And that was me saying, um, yeah, you know, we we expect you to start transitioning to a circular economy the younger generations are waking up to the reality that this entire system that you guys have been selling to us is like very clean and green and sleek and futuristic is actually built on an empire of exploita- exploitation and extraction. Yeah. Um, and like here are the clear deliverables that we're expecting from you going forward. Yeah. And honestly, uh, you know, some people who were very high up in the tech industry approached me after that and are interested in what I have to say. Mm. And so I'm, you know, I don't want to speak on, oh, this person said this or whatever, because if I say it publicly, then then I'm not going to actually be able to make something out of that. Yeah. But yeah, like being in those rooms with those very influential, powerful people um, is, is, a, is a privilege. It's a new privilege that I have, but I want... I think that someone with these values needs to be there so that Mm. because no one else is going to tell them. I've had that experience many times where I'll be talking to uh, maybe the head of sustainability at a Fortune 500 company and I present them an idea because we're arguing. (laughs) I'm always arguing with them. Yeah. I present them an idea where I'm like, well, you could really easily change this and it would change everything about this. And they're like, we we could do that and to me that idea seems like my bread and butter but i guess no one it's never occurred to them because they live in an echo chamber so i'm realizing having those conversations and being in that room actually can make a really big difference so true wow um that's really inspiring and i'm pretty sure like everybody's saying like hey this is so inspiring and stuff so i don't want to like be the not a person like that but still like just like seriously that's really inspiring and it's really cool i th- i mean i'm not i don't that doesn't make me uncomfortable because I think we need better role models. And if, yeah. and if me just walking in my purpose and like being, you know, straight with my values can be inspirational to people, that's a good thing. Because I think, I mean, I keep saying this, but like the fast fashion girlies are eating us up. Like, you know, there's no, there's no one who has a message on social media in climate or labor or, um, any social impact thing that has the size audiences as like, you yeah, know, so true. like models. 
And I think we need better role models because that's driving consumerism, consumption and exploitation. Yeah. Definitely. And uh, I'm just saying that because I don't want to like kind of be like another person who's just like tokenizing the youth somehow, you know, then they're like saying like, oh, yo, you're so inspiring. That the youth thing too is so strange because I'm like, youth is not a permanent identity and I'm not, I'm not a teenager, you yeah. know, like I have something important to say and it's informed by my identities as a woman, as a person of color. Yeah. Um, and also as youth, but that's not something that I can keep. So I don't want to be held up as a youth climate activist because so does that make me less important to listen to as I get older? Mm. You know, I have a very specific vision. I have a very specific agenda of how I want to shape the world and how I want to, you know, I want to help build an army of solutionists. I want to help empower the next generation to solve this problem and intergenerationally as well but where my stronghold is is the next generation and that's not going to become irrelevant when i turn 30. yeah for sure i mean i think we will like dive in right now like really soon now to your vision to your solutions you have in your mind and also to your work um but as you just mentioned that um you're kind of a little bit tired of telling your story over and over again and, and I really respect it, but still, I would just like be interested just to understand your perspective, maybe how your values are or were formed. So mm -hmm. um, just that we have like a better understanding of you as a person in that sense. Do you maybe give, can you give us like a small uh, insight of, yeah, seriously, like how were your values like formed? No, and that's then, a good question, yeah. And then maybe from there on, we can like move on to... Um, to the vision you have? Okay, yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I mean, like I said, I, I started out with feminism, with racial justice as my most, or I guess as my first loves. Feminism was my first love. I think feminism informs my values so deeply still because, I mean, one thing that I'm really passionate about personally is the intersection of feminism and climate, which would be family planning. So it's so controversial, like no one really wants to talk about it because it's like very overpopulation is a very controversial um, thing and I have so much to say on it, but now is not the time. I do think though, we can't deny, I mean, Project Drawdown ranked family planning and educating women and girls as number six and seven out of a hundred solutions to climate change. They're that high up. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is when you give women autonomy and you allow them to self-select, for when and how many children they want to have, um, they they will self-select for a, for a lower population size. And that is good for the climate, but it's also just good because no one should be forced to have children they don't want to have. Yeah. And so that's a huge part of the framework that informs my values is I'm, I was a girl first, I'm a young woman now. And like, I, I don't, I said in my web summit speech, we're not interested in a version of the future in which the climate is stable, but people are still being exploited. Yeah. And I mean, in terms of racial justice, the realization too that it's, and I'm sure, I feel like everyone always says this, but it's, you know, environmental justice is the, is the nexus at which we need to be addressing climate because there's no instance in which they're destroying the planet and not exploiting people. Um, I always say, and this is one of the frameworks I've developed, but like the first thing, like, okay, the first thing to do if you want to force people into exploitative working conditions, living conditions, whether that's a sweatshop or a factory or a mine or a field is to destroy the ecosystem that keeps them, that, yeah. that they, that they depend on. Because nobody would agree to work in t for starving wages if they could support themselves. Yeah. So you go and you pollute their water, you destroy their feet, their their agriculture, etc., and then you can force them into into stark situations. So, like, it is all so deeply interconnected, and I, I think we need to like have that conversation more. So realizing that environmentalism was like the one overarching thing. And I mean, like if anyone's looking for a book recommendation, I would say like how Europe underdeveloped Africa is a great one. Mm -hmm. Like Africa is the most re resource rich continent on the planet. Europe does not have very many natural resources and it's so wealthy because it steals because Europe steals. Yeah. And so like, if you really want to care about the climate, like 
it's or if you really want to care about racial justice you should go towards the other one <laughs> yeah definitely and thank you so much for bringing in this perspective um so you mentioned now quite often now this framework of your thinking somehow and honestly like i find it so inspiring what just like so interesting right now that how clear your thoughts are somehow like you're really like <clears throat> like i get it somehow and it, it makes sense when you say that even just like the last thing you just said like that you need to like um pollute the water to actually make the people to to be able to exploit those peoples um but maybe we can now dive in a little bit into um yeah this framework you've been talking about quite often you already maybe touched upon some topics about that but maybe you can still like for all the people who are right now listening and maybe they are not experts in this field they are like really new into this work and this field and that they can maybe still like follow you so do you mind to give us like an introduction to your thinking of this framework that we have like a better understanding of that the core principle of the framework is the circular economy and i also want to say you know what i have developed with sustainable and just future is not rocket science. I mean, it's just that no one had done it before. It's not really like, it's not like I invented any of these frameworks. It's mm. just that no one has really compiled interdisciplinary environmental solutions before. And I mean, there are pieces that are original thought and there's like, you know, terms that I've coined and whatnot, but um, I want to give credit where credit is due. I didn't birth the concept of circular economy. Yeah. But the core, the core of my, or, okay, in all of my thinking and research and whatnot, what I keep coming back to is we can't solve climate change on renewable energy. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation says that we can only trend, we can only address half of the emissions reductions that we need it with renewable energy mm. um, while staying under 1.5. The other half is going to have to come from demand reduction and efficiency. And demand reduction means we need to transition to not a low carbon economy, but a low energy economy. Mm -hmm. And this is so controversial. This is so controversial. It goes against all of the people in power and their desires and like all of the current economic frameworks. Yeah. But the people in power and the current economic frameworks are sprinting us towards three degrees Celsius by 2100. So fuck them. Fuck yeah. that. <laughs> um. So dialing back a little bit. So, you know, we have to shrink the fashion industry. We have to shrink the tech industry in a lot of ways. We have to stop um, relentlessly building poorly planned cities that are based on cars. Like, and and so, much of, um, so much of emissions are embedded in the supply chain. I don't think people quite realize that between... 65 and 72% of the world's um, carbon emissions can be linked to consumerism. Mm -hmm. so, and that's from like the mine or the field or wherever it is that we're getting, you know, the cotton or the copper or whatever it is. Yeah. And then the transportation of those materials to a factory and then the factory's emissions. And then you have to, you know, you probably send it to a couple of different factories depending on, you know, like, for example, like if for this microphone, like you had to get the metals out of a mine, but then you had to take them somewhere to be like purified. And then you have to take those to a different factory, probably on the other side of the world. And then you have to shape them into mm -hmm. this little piece. And then there's probably another factory where this whole thing gets assembled and then it gets shipped to us in the global North. Um, and, and it's like, it's not like the shipping emissions, you know, all the, the world's transportation sector is 14% of emissions, which is not, not in, insignificant, but I think, I think people think that cars are probably like 25% of global emissions. They're like 7%. Mm. It's like not that serious. Like if we're, you know, we're spending so much time and money talking about um, and trying to solve like the car problem and like investing in electric vehicles, what we could do first and what would be more ethical and like easier to do is talk about the supply chain and how we can shrink the amount of things that we're um, or like we need to just, we need to just lessen production, Yeah. but lessening production obviously sounds like you're going to cause an economic collapse. And so that's not just it. You can't just do that. Um, we don't want to just like hurdle ourselves into a recession. Um, so building a circular economy where, you know, money can still be made, like, you know, economists want me to say that. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it is important. Don't get me wrong. It is important. Um, you know, I'm just like, 
yeah, I'm I'm not I'm the least business oriented for it. No, yeah. that's not true. I'm really no, I'm hearing you. I get. I'm really yeah. getting dragged, <laughs> kicking and screaming into like finance and tech and entrepreneurship right now. But like on the climate side, I guess, and yeah. also to like yell at those industry leaders. So it's happening. Um, but so yeah, so it's uh you know money still has to be made jobs have to be created, et cetera. And so that means looking at an economy that's more based on services rather than goods. Yeah. So that's repair and also like there's so much opportunity to have transitional business models that get us from point A to point B, like a car share or like a bike share. How like in New York City everywhere you can like drop off a bike and like pick it up somewhere else. Yeah, get to um, you. Yeah, and the same thing with cars. So not Uber where you have a driver, but like gig in the Bay Area where you like pick up the car yourself. And you're turning the concept of a car from a good that you consume and own to a service that we all participate in. Yeah. And then the cars, there are way less cars on the road. They're, um, the, the utilization rate is way higher because the average car spends 90% of its life just sitting, yeah. not being driven. And so like, et cetera, et cetera. I could like, I could continue to list the benefits, but that kind of thing, like there's so much more, op there's so much opportunity for regenerative and circular business models that are either like based in, you know, regenerative food systems and indigenous knowledge, or that are like enabling us to continue living our lives in the infrastructure that we have, which is like, you know, car centric, tech centric, you know, um, we just, we just have, we have this very corporate world that's, that's been built and it's hard to just, you know, we don't want to just like you know, raise it all to the ground. So we need to transition out of it gently. Yeah. But yeah, I totally get you. And that's so, I really love the fact that you're like so envisioning like how things can be so different. I'm just like also so inspired, like how you like so, you know, the facts, just like <laughs> as a question and maybe it sounds dumb and don't get me wrong. I don't want to like, it's, I just want to be like the person like, what, 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 where are the numbers from? But like, like, did you study something in this field <laughs> that you know those things or like how Do, do you know those things? Do you, do you mind if I ask that? Yeah, yeah. Honestly, I didn't go to school much at Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was so busy doing everything else and, and writing my course. Um, I, I think I just have one of those brains where I can remember facts like off the top okay, of my head. Wow. Um, and yeah, a lot, of these con a lot of these numbers as well that I'm dropping are core concepts for me. So I use them every day. I get you. Um, I get you. So yeah, or it's something that maybe I gave a speech three weeks ago. And so I like was researching those numbers and fact checking them and making sure they're right. So they're like right on the top of my head. Okay, but still like that we have like, more like a clear picture. And I mean, you already mentioned so much, but I really like this concept somehow. I think it, it maybe can work really well with you. But that we have now like the people right now listening that they are that they can also make sense of the facts and the things you're saying and like the how a circular uh, economy could look like. Maybe we can make like a, like a walk in our imagination. And maybe we could approach ourselves like at a place, maybe like a city, and maybe like a place which you might call home soon, maybe New York. And maybe we can like walk maybe to like a grocery or to walk to like through the streets. So like really that we have like understanding how the place would maybe look like in your vision. So maybe you can like describe like certain fields like, yeah, that would not be any more like that. Maybe it would be like that. And then we have like a better understanding, like more like on like a visual level. And from there on, maybe we can like dive in then to your current work and also like the hurdles you're facing. But just to really like pinpoint it down, like that we have like a really clear vision and under like understanding of your vision. I think if you're okay with that, maybe we can continue a little bit into this field and then we can go take a turn also to like the hurdles you're facing coming to the vision. Yeah, I like that question because I think a good way to frame infrastructure change for people is to yeah, take it down to that everyday, uh, real life, daily example. So like if, I mean, New York is not a sustainable place Most Western cities just aren't, and it's going to be really difficult to transform them. But so let's take just a any city, for example. So for one, okay, let's take one issue, disposability. Yeah. So, you know, America is responsible for, and don't fact check me on, or do fact check me on this, because I'll, I'll disclaim when I'm not 100% certain of a, of a fact, mm -hmm. but I'm almost positive that America is responsible for 30% of the world's waste. 
which is crazy because we have 5% of the world's population. Um, so disposability is a real problem. And it's not just like, I think a lot of people try to like just pinpoint on like plastic bottles, right? Or, or straws or whatever. Plastic is a problem. Plastic is 4% of the world's carbon emissions, but it's not just plastic. It's also like we throw away so many clothes, Halloween costumes, furniture, technology. Like we throw away everything. We consume so much and we throw it, throw it all away. Mm. And even like, I think it's like 85% of what we donate gets thrown away in the, in the United States. Wow, okay. Yeah, so we're throwing everything away and we consume so much. So slowing down the consumer. So, you know, you're walking on the street in an American city and this is in Sage's ideal version of, that ne- of this next generation American city. If you go to pick up a coffee, um, it comes in a reusable cup that you can drop off at any other location. Like any other coffee shop in the city, you can just drop it off. It's going to get cleaned there and reused. So you still have the convenience of a coffee on the on the go, but you no no waste in that system. Um, you have the main the main city center should have basically no cars, maybe just like scooters allowed in, um, and so it's like fully walkable, fully transformed into human. There's no you would also we would also be getting rid of a lot of the storefronts. We'd be getting over a lot of the commercial center. I know that's like for a lot of people, they're like, ah, what about the economy? Yeah. The economy is going to shrink one way or another. This is what I always say to people. The economy is going to shrink one way or another. It's going to happen because our e- the ecosystem upon which the economy is based on collapses, which is what we're on track for by 2100. Or we can try to do this in a more planned ethical, equitable way. But degrowth is going to happen one way or another. The global supply chain, if we hit three degrees Celsius, which we are on track for in less than 80 years, the global supply chain will completely collapse. Production will stop. So, you know, sorry to the Lululemon lovers of the world, but like, gotta go. It's gotta shrink. So a lot of those storefronts that sell consumer goods that are ultimately like the root cause of this ecological crisis would have to go. Um, in their place, we want to see more thrift, more secondhand, more places where you can like you know, keep things cycling, um, repair, but also in the interest of like economic betterment and the sale of services over goods, there's this beautiful opportunity to reinvest our time and money into services, experiences, culture. So instead of storefronts lining every street in New York City, we could have dance classes, cooking classes, late night like cafes with library, you know, books, just more centered on our economy should be more centered on enjoying life than owning things. And we can you can extrapolate this to wellness, yoga, meditation centers, massages, sports, places that are safe for children to hang out at late at night. We literally just need to revert back to a society that has more third spaces, places where you can spend money on on experiences, services, art installations, and less the sale of goods. And and that is like, and that you can break it down so simply, but like that's fundamentally one of the largest solutions to the ecological crisis. Ah! (laughs) Um, So I, you know, I could keep going, but obviously you'd want to have like, you'd want to see more green spaces in a city and uh, urban agriculture, you know, let's transform some of these skyscrapers into basically gigantic hydroponic farms. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a vegetarian, but you could make them aquaponics with fish. Like you could keep going. There's so many different. And so when you lay it out like this too, like, first of all, you feel good. Yeah. You're, you're visioning this with me and we're like, wow, that I want to live so in that cool, world. Seriously, yeah. But two, if you are, if you yourself are interested in becoming an entrepreneur, or a software engineer, or um, you can do anything. You can do anything and play a role in crafting this vision together. We just need everyone to be on the same page. And that's mm-hmm. what I'm trying to do is get everyone this vision so that we can all work on it together. Because yeah. I think right now, the current way we talk about climate change is so abstract and large. So most people think the only thing we can do is like hope that Joe Biden builds more solar farms But that's not it. The root cause of the ecological crisis is not fossil fuels because that's the how, not the why. We have an economic system that incentivizes environmental destruction. So the root root problem is the economy and the root solution 
is an economic transition and we can all play a role in that. Mm. Yo, thank you so much for like really like spitting out those clear words. I think we really need that. We need like sometimes like this kind of like slap on your <laughs> on the back of your head, you know, like, hey, come on, wake up, like see through, you know. But well, when we have now this vision, um, the question I think now is quite obvious. Uh, how do we get there? And so seriously, like, how do we get there? Yeah. Maybe like you can like lay out like some thoughts on that, but also like, I know what are seriously the hurdles to that? Because I think in general, we need like a complete shift of uh, values. Yes. Um, so maybe, um, seriously, what are your takes on, um, how do we get there? What do you think is important? And also for the people right now listening that maybe they can have this feeling of, okay, yeah, that could be actually like a real, like a reality and not just like a beautiful idea of you and your mind. I think it's a kind of multifaceted because it's like for one, we can each play a role in, you know, making these sustainable enterprises and um, communities a reality. But for two, there has to be like a finance mechanism and a policy mechanism that enables them. And so it's not just, you know, people can start businesses or people can transition their work, their line of work, or people can try to start initiatives in their community. And I'm also a huge advocate for local level action because I don't think that waiting around for national or international action is um, realistic or really the solution because I think a lot of the reason why we're in this problem is because of this like one size fits all, like, mm. like let's try one solution for everything blanket kind of way. So I think the response to the ecological crisis needs to be regional. Yeah. Um, so people can do that, but then also, yes, there needs to be like a political framework that enables this to happen and a financial framework that enables this to happen. Because right now, the reason we're not heavily investing in circular economy enterprises, I mean, amongst others, um, is because profit is still like the ultimate bottom line of the economic system. And so when you're looking at shareholders, venture capitalists, um, investors, et cetera, they are looking for that like 20% annual growth rate. And you can only scale with certain companies that way. And they're never necessarily companies that make the world a better place. Mm. Um, so I am trying, like I am getting heavily involved in climate finance because I think that I think there's a lot for me to learn there. And I think this is ultimately the way, the mechanism through which I'm going to be able to accomplish this vision is for one, I want to educate the next generation and get them on board. But for two, I want to personally help invent the framework in terms of finance and, po and policy that enables this transition to happen. We have to have a government regulation on the size of companies and on the profits and on CEO uh, wages and et cetera in order for any of this to happen, because right now our entire system is incentivizing companies that grow the fastest, exploitation, um, slave labor in the supply chain, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're not, we're not going to solve those problems with philanthropy we're, because philanthropy is, comes from the same system that birthed it. Like we have to solve those problems with a different framework. So yeah, so like I think individual people have a role to play in their communities, in their businesses, in their line of work in their ecosystems. There's so much we can do in terms of like ecosystem restoration and regenerative agriculture. And honestly, at the nexus of those things too, because agriculture shouldn't be considered as like divorced from ecosystems. I mean, most of the world is like North America had these, the East coast of North America had these beautiful food forests that were carefully crafted by indigenous people um, that didn't take, didn't require much, much maintenance at all. And, you know, when white Europeans arrived, they were like, wow, there's so much bounty here. There's just like berries and nuts everywhere. And it's just like hanging off the trees and it's growing out of the floor. And then, <laughs> and if you were to have asked the natives at the time, they were like, yeah, we designed it that way, dummy. Yeah. Like you don't need like super labor intensive fields. And it was an ecology. It was an ecosystem that the people were a part of. And I, I'm not saying they don't exist anywhere on the world anymore, but I'm saying that we should all take that as inspiration. And that's something that we can, that we, you could accomplish on the local level. Yeah. But I also, there also there has to be this shift in the financial and political infrastructure. So that's what I am um, 
my goal for 2024 is to just learn as much as I can, get as, as elbow deep as I, neck deep as I possibly can in that world and figure out um, how to marry these two forces that I'm passionate about and like make a difference with it. Mm. Definitely. And when you were now thinking about or explaining those things, what were like maybe like the major hurdles you were facing, but maybe you can also like describe after one a big highlight when you were saying, hey, things are actually like getting better and things are working out. So maybe we start with the hurdles or one or two if you want to share and then like we can go to the highlight. The biggest hurdle I think is like legitimacy. I mm. mean, I was 19 when I started the program at Berkeley mm. and no one took me seriously for a solid two years, um, two and a half. And it took a while for me to get to a point where people, anybody wanted to take, and honestly, like it sucks because a lot of the legitimacy comes from something like Time Magazine or like now Sustainable and Just Future has been, has joined the Clinton Global Initiatives, like 2023 Commitment to Action. And they invited us to apply for that, right? And when I'm talking to, um, people who are influential in the world, they're not taking me seriously until and unless I, yeah. someone tells them like, oh, this girl is in Time Magazine or something like that. Um, and that sucks. It's like you get your legitimacy from these institutions, but um, it's not like, again, like I said earlier, it's not like I wasn't doing exactly what I'm doing now before those institutions like acknowledged me or be decided that I was, I was worth a shot or something like that. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, youth organizations, woman led organizations, woman of color led organizations get a, like a literal percentage. Like I think youth, youth organizations get like 0.4% of philanthropy or something like that. Are you kidding me? Yeah. 0.4. I think. Don't quote yeah, me on that one. Yeah, you guys got to you guys got to google that one because I'm not it's entirely certain on that. But yeah, like um fundraising is really difficult, but it's getting easier. It's just like it, it's not a super accessible world and so like I have a really great philanthropy mentor, but I don't know where I would be without her, stuff like that. Yeah. Um and yeah, like ultimately I I would rather not be ask I don't want to think about money at all I just want to accomplish my vision but we live in this we live in this infrastructure yeah and I want to pay people for their work I want to pay my team for their work and whatnot so yeah I've been I've been heavily fundraising this year and or I've been spending a lot of time fundraising this year and that's prevent that's slowed down my mission and my progress but I think 2024 is going to be a big year like I, I the timeline is is lining up but it, you know like I, I launched SJF 10 months ago mm -hmm. and you know, don't get me wrong, we've made an incredible amount of progress in 10 months, but it's way slower than I expected just because yeah. of all of the bureaucracy that you have to jump through. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, there have been times where I, like, have gone hungry. There have been times when I was sleeping on the couch with my grandma's, like, you know, effectively homeless. Um, right now, like I mentioned earlier, I don't have a house right now. Like, I've been out of a suitcase the last four months, and I'm... But that that's circumstantial. I'm definitely not in the same situation as I was back then financially. Like, this is this is something that I had to do just because, like, I had to be in New York and I had to be in Portugal and now I'm in Dubai and, like, you know, I'm going to L.A. after this. Um, but it's it's not been easy and I've had to make a lot of sacrifices and mm. a lot of the time I wasn't sure if this was something I could pull off at all because I grew up in a low-income community and I didn't have someone to support me or fund me while I tried to make this happen for myself, but... It is starting to work out. Yeah, wow. But yo, this is so, so, I mean, I'm repeating myself, but like uh, inspiring, 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 but this is like really strong. Thank you. Strong Let's go with that word. word. Yeah, strong it's so word. strong. And like for all the people maybe out there who are maybe, who maybe live in a low income family, who are maybe um, young, uh, young girl, young woman, maybe not white, uh, which message would you, would you have to those peoples um, as you kind of like, you really grew and you are so, um, you're so strong and you're like really like living it. So like, I'm, don't get me wrong. I don't want to say like, hey, 
now you accomplish everything you wanted to, but maybe still like which advice would you have liked to listen when you were younger, you know? That's not easy. That's really not easy. Um, I guess like don't try and do it alone. Honestly, like I did. I've done every. I've done this whole thing. Okay, I should I should qualify that. I've had an amazing team, and I've had so much help along the way, but all from people who are my age or younger. Um, in terms of mentorship or leadership or getting a hand up, I've never had that until the past four months where I actually started looking, or not even looking, but actually found people who were older and more experienced and wanted to help me figure this out. Mm -hmm. And I'm going so much faster because of that. I think on the one hand, there weren't a lot of people who could have given me a hand up because I was doing something that had never been done. And a lot of like, you know, for example, a lot of the faculty at Berkeley don't like my program because we have a higher approval rate than them. And because we're criticizing them, we're saying yeah. you're not doing a good job in environmental education. So we're doing it ourselves. So it wasn't easy for me to find mentorship or like guidance in that regard. But yeah, like now I'm starting to meet, especially like women who are in the environmental space or policy or um, tech or f whatever it is. And like learning from them has been a blessing. So I would say like find someone with more experience, find someone who... Because at this point, I, I, I will say, like, I'll always give millennials their flowers because mm -hmm. I think there's too much beef between Gen Z and millennials. But, like, millennials have done so much, especially low income, especially millennials of color, especially, women, like, woman millennials have done so much to create a space that Gen Z can just hang out in now. Yeah, so true. And, and it's such a blessing. Like, there's so many women who have looked at me and said, I see myself in you who, yeah, grew up low income or, you know, whatever, whatever, and they want to help me out. Yeah. And so I just want to give them their flowers and just acknowledge that, like, we, Gen Z, like, no longer has to go at it alone because someone has created a space so that we don't have to cover up our tattoos or not have blue hair or whatever because, you know, they came in and learned the corporate role, but also we're like, yeah, that's all, that's all crap. So, like, mm -hmm. we're not going to really enforce that with the next generation. So, yeah, I want to acknowledge that. Thank you so much for doing that seriously and such an important perspective. So um, I, I asked you now about the hurdles you're facing and you mentioned quite a few and which are really difficult to overcome. But still, maybe we can also shine some light on the highlights, maybe like of the past years when you were doing your work, like a, so maybe like one memory or I don't know, Pretty sure there are many memories but maybe you can like share one or two memories which really stood out and you were like man mm. this is nice you know like this is nice like i am at the place where i want to be and like things are working out so which are mm. the, maybe like maybe you can share like a highlight of your of your past past well, time not to mention the ones that i've already mentioned but i do want to like put a qualifier in like I am eternally grateful for things like Time Magazine and all of like even the opportunity to speak to the world's largest tech summit on the main stage in front of like thousands and thousands of people yeah I don't have to get those opportunities I do think I deserve them because some like we really do need like an intergenerational and intersectional dialogue and by me being in those spaces and also by bringing my my people in there with me right I'm trying really hard to lift as I climb and make sure I'm I'm not just doing this selfishly, right? Yeah. Um, you know, those those things have changed my life. And as much as it's like frustrating that like whether or not I get those opportunities to, is dependent on the legitimacy I have, at the same time it legitimizes me. And I'm very grateful to everybody who who like acknowledged that and, and gave me my flowers. Um, but also, honestly, I think like getting deep inside the belly of the environmental space has given me the most amazing network of like love and support. I get a pause, like my best moments from the past year are like laying on the floor of one of my best friend's apartment who is the most genius, she's the most genius girl ever. She like was working at SpaceX and then was like, I actually have to save the world and gave up her dream job of mm -hmm. becoming an astronaut to um, 
start trying to solve climate change. And now she's doing a PhD in, in um, physics at, at, at Columbia. Wow. And so moments like that where I'm laying on her floor and we're tearing apart Bill Gates' book about climate and like giving, being like, I agree with him on that. I don't agree with him on that. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Like those are the best moments of my life where I'm like, I feel seen, I feel witnessed and like I'm not alone and we're doing this collaboratively. I have so many friends who I like... Um, admire and and want to walk next to and we push each other and those are the best highlights of the last year mm. yeah well, thank you so much for sharing that seriously um well i think slowly like we're moving more to the end section of our conversation um and i think you're touched upon now that quite often but still maybe that we have like that kind of like really dialed down You mentioned now quite often um, the support system you've got and like the people around you, how important they are. But still like in general, I can imagine when you're doing all this work, like sometimes like things are sometimes still really bleak. Like, I mean, you mentioned a couple of times and I'm also quite aware about that, that we're like heading like at the end of this century, like to like a world maybe which is three degrees warmer. So the consequences are like so drastic, we can't even imagine. Um, Or we can actually imagine them, but they're, they're quite shit to be quite serious. Um, so, um, but you know, here, like speaking all these words, like literally, like, um, I think many people out there right now listening, they're just like, man, who is she? Like, I really want to like, uh, get in touch with her or like follow her work. But when things, sometimes things are hard, how do you keep on going? Because I can imagine that sometimes people really lose hope when they like listen to all those facts and stuff like that. They, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's difficult for them to keep on going. So which advice would you give maybe to those people which helped you maybe on a personal level? I can imagine that those answers are really tightly connected to the answers you maybe already mentioned, but still maybe there's like one other idea, uh, one other idea or thought you would like to add. But like seriously, like on like a personal level, like how do you keep on going, doing the work you want to do or you are doing? I don't personally really struggle with like climate anxiety, sometimes grief, but like not really anxiety ever. Yeah. Um, I think the cards have been dealt and I think may maybe it's almost a little more hopeful to have grown up knowing that this is the future we're prepared for Yeah. or we're on track for because I don't really know, I can't envision it otherwise. Right now, it's just a race to save all to save all we can, and um, yeah, I think like we're already in a terrible situation, and we're just I'm just trying to help strategize how we can carve a livable future out of a climate changed world. Um, and I think that that dose of realism and the action orientedness of it is why I just I never really feel hopeless. Yeah. Even we're we're sitting at. COP28 right now in Dubai and yesterday all mention of fossil fuels were struck from the negotiations. I do not feel any sense of panic or alarm. I don't expect any better from them. I'm not waiting on them to act. Ultimately, yes, <laughs> real ch systemic change has to come from the system. But I think regardless, all of us, the eight billion of us are going to keep trying to strategize how to transform the system and how to keep one another safe as best we can. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not I'm not waiting on these losers to save us. 100%. So, and then as you mentioned, you don't, you're not waiting for those people. Maybe there, you can maybe wait a little bit on the people who are right now listening. Maybe there are now really people out there who will really connect with you in your word. And they want to somehow be an ally to you. And they want to be in solidarity with you in your work. And so which call to action would you give those people out there right now listening if they want to be an ally to you and your work or maybe just in general, which call to action would you give those people? Find a role in degrowth and the circular economy, whether that's changing your purchasing practices, being um, yeah, more circular in your own life or some shift in your career. Every job can be a climate job. I staunchly believe that. Or if you're like literally working in the fashion industry, then you've got to switch jobs. <laughs> um, we each have a big role to play and what you do with your, you know, 46 hours a week of work is a huge part of that. What you do with your lifestyle is another huge part of that. We have to stop pretending that like we're just somebody, someone else is burning fossil fuels just for funsies. It's, it's because they're incentivized to do it. And all of us in the system incentivize them to do it. Am I an angel? No, but, um, you know, 
we we each live in this infrastructure so don't like feel guilty don't feel like you know don't tear don't tear, tear yourself up over the role that you play but like we each can play a role in transitioning towards a regenerative future definitely thank you so much for sharing those words so the last question in my podcast is always the same we already touched upon that quite often but still uh, maybe there's something you you mentioned that you didn't mention before but what means hope to you and what still gives you hope in times like these hope isn't something i really engage with i don't feel hope i just am am focused on the all we can say the race to save all we can i feel joy often because i'm surrounded by wonderful people who are trying to do the right mm. thing and i feel drive often mm -hmm. um i don't think that i need hope um but yeah there isn't there isn't much of it available i believe that humanity will persevere one way or another however like how many people we lose is up to how many you know how many um degrees we're able to scale back in terms of warming but um humanity will persevere it's just like how many how many people we lose, how much destruction will we face. And so I don't really feel the need to like engage with the idea of hope because it's literally just like, okay, well, <laughs> what can we do right now? <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Definitely. That's a really um, unique answer somehow, <laughs> but I like it. Yeah, yeah, I know a lot of people who identify as like climate optimists and I'm like, no. <laughs> but I, I feel good, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, I feel happy. I get... A full night of sleep and I, I have a smoothie every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do yoga. <laughs> yeah. I take care of myself and I take care of the people around me and I try my best to uh, take care of, of the, the ecosystem that sustains us and the systems that I'm in. Um, so I'm not, I'm not personally being torn up about the ecological, ecological crisis. Like it's not destroying me. And maybe that is because I grew up with this reality and so I just had to learn how to... Because I used to. I used to be like... I used to feel like the world was on my shoulders and it was my problem to solve. And I used to be a, a very unhappy person because yeah. I was a climate activist. But I had to learn to, like the whole concept of like put your oxygen mask on first. Um, I had to learn how to save and take care of myself before I could save and take care of anyone else mm. or the planet. I think those are like some really, really important words um, to kind of like um, wrap up our conversation. Honestly, Sage, um, thank you so much for taking your time to be here. It's been a really a big privilege um, to talk to you. And also, as you mentioned earlier, um, before we started the podcast, you mentioned that you are quite on a schedule and that you don't have like much time or you don't prioritize so much like being on interviews and stuff. So uh, honestly, like out of that perspective, I'm just really, really grateful that we had the chance to listen to you. Thank I you. know how unique it is. And um, I really hope that the people out there are like, listen to you, like seriously listen to you and that they get inspired. So um, just one last thing, how can they find the, your work? Maybe you can say that. And at the end, the, how you say, um, the last words in this podcast are always the ones for my guest. So um, if there are like some last ideas or some last thoughts you feel like sharing and I didn't like touch upon in my questions, feel free to do so. Um, but it would be nice maybe also when you can just like say how the people can find your work that then they find it. And from my side, Sage, I want to say thank you. Thank you for taking your time again. And I wish you all the best. And the last words are yours. You can find me on Instagram and TikTok at Sage Lanier, L-E-N-I-E-R. And you can find SJF at Sustainable and Just Future or on our website, which is the same, .org, sustainablejustfuture.org. And um, I feel like we covered all of my last ideas. So <laughs> no, nothing else. <laughs>